What's up everyone? Welcome to my stream. Very, very happy to be with you on this very special day. I have a feeling that I say special day every day. We are live uh, with Elevate My Chess and Mr. Ken Green. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. All right, uh, Mr. Uh, can I... Uh, Mr. Mr. Ken, uh, we are live with uh, close to 100 viewers already. So um, it oh, is that's really... awesome. That's awesome. I just uh, reactivated my account. And yes. And I started following you on Twitch as well. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for uh, for this collaboration today. Uh, maybe uh, you could take the time to introduce yourself to to my chat and maybe talk about Elevate My Chess and what you guys are are doing. Well, certainly I can do that. I can do that. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so everyone watching, my name is Ken Green. I am the founder of Elevate My Chess Canada, and we are a chess event uh, company. So we organize chess events. Because of COVID, we've not been able to hold live events uh, in the last couple of months, but we're hoping, hoping that we'll be back to that. So we run a couple of events um, every year. Uh, the plan is to run at least four events every year. And we also run uh, I Am Num, Num events. Uh, the last one we did was just before COVID in February. Uh, and it was a success. So check us out, elevatemychess.com for all our upcoming events. And we'll be happy to connect with you. I uh, made sure to include your... Uh... Your beautiful logo as well as your as your website and uh and my layout as you can see i don't know if you're watching the stream right now but uh i'm not, I'm not but... okay uh well i mean uh so just to sum up uh, i have a live chat over here ready to ask questions but i guess you have some people on your side also ready to ask questions am i correct that's right so as soon as we finish the first part of the interview i'm gonna open it up for questions uh, okay that... for them that's awesome. And for those of you that are that are live on Zoom, if you want to ask questions, uh, there is a question and answer button. You can use that to ask your question, or you can just drop it in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so from time to time, I'm gonna be looking through the chat, and then I will I can pass that question over to uh, FM Lafong. And once we finish uh, with the interview, I can actually unmute you guys and you guys can ask your questions live. Perfect. Okay, all right, so maybe we can get started. Um, so again, thank you for making the time to do this. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. I know you're a busy, busy young man, <laughs> blogging away, and that is good. Uh, awesome, awesome. So why don't we start with, uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself. When did you start playing chess and what really got you interested in chess? Um, so basically, um, everyone has the same story that, you know, their dad or their mom taught them to play chess. But uh, in my case, um, I was at my babysitter's place. Uh, I was around maybe six years old and mm -hmm. uh, I was a very high energy kid. Um, I, I wasn't the most quiet kid. And my babysitter, to uh, try to calm me down, decided to, uh, to teach me chess. And uh, I guess it worked <laughs> because uh, the, same, the same day, I, uh, I really liked the game. I came home and I talked to uh, my dad. I said, Dad, my babysitter just uh, taught me chess and uh, let's play. So he went to the store, bought a chess board, maybe bought a book. I don't remember. But uh, started uh, started playing with me. This is how I got to uh, to play chess. Interesting. I mean, yes. it's not that common to find babysitters that know how to play chess, and uh, so that is uh, that is quite interesting. So, yes. did you have to teach your dad how to play chess, or your dad already knew how to play? Um, I think it's pretty unclear. Uh, if he knew, he really knew the basics. Uh, basically, I think we pretty much learned together. Uh, we oh, pretty okay. much learned together. Uh, I think he was still better than me at the beginning, uh, but uh, what we're talking about like maybe a week or two, <laughs> not like a year, <laughs> just a week or two maybe. And uh, I mean, I I always had a, sort of an, of an ability 
uh, and a natural understanding to the game. Like I, I don't, I don't remember a period of of my childhood where I was blundering queens and just not understanding basic tactics. Like I always had a sense of tactics, and uh, oh, it really helped me uh, as a kid. Wonderful, wonderful. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what actually caught your interest in chess? Was it the shapes of the pieces? Was it the way they move? Was um, it something about the nature of the game in terms of thinking ahead? I, I think I'm a very competitive person and maybe okay. chess uh, definitely fueled me towards this uh, direction. I like the fact that uh, it's obviously not something I could explain as a kid. Um, but looking back, I like the fact that in chess, I am fully in control of what I do. If I play a card game, a dice game, anything involving luck, I could make all the best moves and still lose. In chess, uh, if, I, if I lose a game, I only have myself to blame, which is uh, very good in a way, because if I try to improve, I know exactly what to work on. So this is awesome. what got me interested to chess. That's right. That's right. So that's great. Great that your your, your dad uh, supported you. Do you have other siblings that play chess, or are you? Uh, I'm sorry. Do I have? Uh... Do you have other brothers and sisters that play chess as well? Or yes, just I brother? have a little brother who uh, okay. who learned to play chess. He's about three or four years younger than me, and um, he also played chess uh, pretty much uh, all his uh, childhood and teenage years. Uh, we both participated in many many. Uh, tournaments and uh once once we were scholastic canadian scholastic champions together i was in grade six and he oh, was wow, in grade three wonderful. so that was a beautiful mm -hmm. moment wonderful yeah. was he better than you uh unfortunately not unfortunately for him <laughs> not <laughs> he, he he's still a decent player i i think he, he he was a canadian champion twice if i'm not mistaken and he still reached a level of 1800 he he probably didn't have the same passion as I, as I did, and uh, it was okay. more of a thing that he did as a as a little brother. You know, um, if I play, he might as well play. But uh, he discovered a lot of other other passions in life, and uh, he did very well for himself. Oh, okay, awesome, awesome. That's great. That's great. So tell us a little bit about your first competitive uh, moment in chess. Uh, when did you start playing? competitive chess in it other was words very, going very and quick. With others. yeah it was really quick so my babysitter taught me uh, how to play chess i learned with my dad and within a, a few months um i was already in those uh, chess and math tournament uh oh, for for those who are watching from outside uh, outside canada chess and math is a national organization and they uh they offer chess lessons in school and uh, they organize tournaments as well so i spent a lot of my childhood playing in those tournaments and uh, I think if you, within a few months, uh, I was in grade one and I won the, mm -hmm. Quebec's, uh, the Quebec Chess Challenge, which is basically, uh, I was a Quebec oh. Scholastic Champion. And uh, I remember my first year, I went to Ottawa for the Canadian Chess Challenge and I also won oh. that tournament. And oh. I also remember meeting Kevin Spraggett uh, in that tournament. Uh, 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 Canadian Grandmaster who lives in Portugal, if I'm not mistaken. Wow, wow, wonderful, wonderful. So it looks like you actually had uh, success very early in chess, in, in your chess career. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. How did that make you feel? Uh, I mean, going to Ottawa and winning the scholastic uh, chess tournament. Um, how, how did that make you feel? It, what it, kind of confidence did that give you? Uh, it was obviously a very, very good feeling. You know, my, my parents supported me a lot as a as a kid, they made sure that I did a lot of activities, but at some point they clearly saw that chess, uh, you know, I had more talent in chess than in other disciplines. So this, they decided to cut back on, on other activities and really focus on chess and allow me to, uh, allow me to spend more time uh, playing, playing tournaments. And um, I, I would say that my first real breakout in chess was uh, when I was around 10 years old. Uh, so the Chess and Math Association, uh, mm -hmm. they approached me, and back then there was no CYCC. I, I don't know. Do you, have you organized a CYCC with Elevate My Chess? Uh, yes, we've done some qualifying tournaments. Uh -huh. uh, so, right. so the Canadian Youth Chess Championship is a qualifier to the World Youth Chess Championship in Canada, and back then there were no CYCC yet. Like it wasn't a thing. People were not going to the World Youth. So the Chess and Math Association really gave me my first chance because they simply approached my parents and they said, 
listen, Lufang, I think you have a great potential. Uh, we want to send you to the World Youth Chess Championship and we will pay for your expenses. And oh, wow. Yes, it was a very generous offer and uh, an offer that my parents couldn't, couldn't refuse. So they simply booked uh, three plane tickets, uh, my mom, my dad, and my brother, along with me. And oh, wow. uh, we, went to, uh, we went to Germany. And uh, oh. that was my first ever World Youth Chess Championship. I was only rated, I was only rated 1400 back then. And um, technically I was 1400, but uh, I got a chance to compete with uh, some of the best players in the world even today. Uh, in my sections, just to name a few, I had Grishuk, I had Aronian, I had Bacro, wow. Vallejo Pons Francisco, uh, Luke McShane. All those were placed top wow. 10 in, in that tournament. And um, in the last round, I played uh, Ganguly, an Indian GM today. Uh, by wow. the way, all those people are GMs today. So I'm the only one who didn't make it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they're very, very strong players. And uh, I was very fortunate. I beat Ganguly in the last round. And I finished fifth in the world. And that, oh, wow. was, that was a huge, huge breakout for me because... Uh, when, when I had that result, my parents clearly saw that, obviously, I mean, I'm just a, I'm just a kid from Canada, you know, like I'm, I'm competing against Russians, against Europeans, you know, so uh, that, that was really the tournament that uh, made my parents decide that I really had to be serious about chess. Wow, that's so, that's so interesting. So at a very young age, at 10, you got a chance to go to Germany to to represent Canada in the World Youth Chess Championship, and you finished fifth. Uh, that must have been a big celebration for Canada as a whole. For sure. Uh, so that's that's really really awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that uh, about that experience? Uh, uh, I imagine that was your first time traveling out of the country, um, uh, particularly uh, you know in the company of your parents and your sibling and your brother. So tell us a little bit about that experience. I, How was that experience for you overall? It, it was an amazing experience. I mean, uh, my uh, my parents were so happy and so supportive of me, and uh, I, I I got to I got to go again uh, four more times after this during my teenage years oh, wow. to the World Youth, and uh, my parents were only looking forward to this moment every year because they would book their vacation, we would go together as a family, and the tournament would go for what two weeks, but. Uh, we would rent a car and go through Europe and visit many countries. And uh, I, I wasn't too much about traveling back then. I was just a kid. Uh, all I cared about was eating, you know. But uh, <laughs> but looking back, uh, I, I cannot believe that I had a chance to visit so many beautiful countries. But I was just sitting in a car, not paying attention. And I would give anything to <laughs> revisit all those beautiful countries that I, I visited. So when you ask me about telling my experience... Um, I would say that it's not only chess wise, but just the whole experience to be able to travel with my family and have all those opportunities to travel with chess. I'm really, really thankful for that. Well, that's wonderful. That's that's really, really wonderful. Um, I, I, and I believe as a young player, you had dreams of of getting to GM. Uh, I think that's the dream of most Canadian players. Um, and getting the first title is always the, the biggest challenge sometimes. Uh, a lot of players never achieve that. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us um, about your journey to your FM title. Um, when did you start that journey? And, and when did you first get your, I don't know, in those, I don't know if you had FM norm, if you had to go through mm -hmm. uh, that process of, of getting their norm. So tell us a little bit about your journey to your FM title. I, um, I grew up as a kid with uh, my parents, especially my dad, telling me that uh, I would be a doctor and a GM, right? It's uh, the typical, uh, <laughs> typical Asian dad <laughs> who, uh, who told me what my job was going to be, <laughs> what my title was going to be. And um, uh, growing up, I, I would say that uh, I, I definitely had a lot of, uh, of, of talent and uh, but, but, but somehow I, I made FM pretty late. I made FM pretty late, maybe around 19 or 20 years old. Um, I, just, um, I just played less, let's say, after 16 or 17 years old uh, for, for different reasons. I, I guess I wasn't, uh, I wasn't the typical chess guy that you could imagine. Uh, my parents always made sure that I had a very balanced life. 
they wanted me to to hang out with friends to do other activities uh and and back to the germany story my uh, at the world youth chess championship when my parents met uh the other players um some of them were already homeschooled some of them were not even doing schools anymore they were doing chess full time and hmm. I mean, props to them because they, they became very good players, but my parents never wanted that for me. My parents okay. always wanted chess to remain a hobby for me and wanted me to focus on, on my career and my, my studies. Yeah. Uh, and, and with this in mind, uh, maybe I wasn't as aggressive and as ambitious as other players, same age. That's right. So I eventually made FM at uh, around 19 or, or 20 years old. And after making FM, very shortly after making FM, I was in university and life got into the way. Just, uh, you know, normal stuff yeah. that you do in your 20s uh, just got into the way. And slowly, I just stopped playing, but for no specific reason. I don't remember a moment where I said to myself, I don't want to play chess anymore. It just, it just came very slowly and naturally. And before I knew, I was not really playing anymore. I was doing other stuff. I was traveling. I was hanging out with friends. I was focusing on university. Um, I somehow always stay connected to chess, though. I, 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 mm -hmm. I started teaching chess at 16 years old. I had my first student at 16 years old and I never stopped even even in the years after 20 years old where I stopped playing chess yeah. I um I always did some teaching but for some very unknown reason I stopped playing and uh this is something that not everyone knows right they they, they see me today they see the kid I was sure, sure. and they see the teacher I am today and they have trouble imagining that I took a break somehow or sometime <laughs> Um, so I would say that I stopped for a while, at least, uh, a good, maybe seven, eight years. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know if there are other questions, but I'm just no, going on and yeah, on. Yeah, there are, there are other questions. Yes. So, so that's fine. So that, that probably explains the, the reason why you got your FM at a later, yeah. uh, at a later age, uh, which makes sense. I know one of the challenges, um, and I think your story is similar to a lot of other chess uh, players here. Uh, parents always want them to focus on a career outside of chess, mm -hmm. and I think it's understandable for uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, so one of the challenges I know uh, players, particularly young players, struggle with is balancing school with chess. And I know that's something you've had to deal with. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that struggle. What are some of the things you had to do to overcome the challenge and to be able to balance your studies with chess uh, early, in, early in, the, in your chess career? Yeah, there, there are really no secrets. I mean, um, there is, you, you cannot just say that uh, you're gonna do this much in school, this too much in chess, and it's gonna be enough. You have to sacrifice something at some point. And I think when I was young, what I sacrificed was maybe my social life. I mean, on Friday nights, my dad would take me to the chess club. On Saturday, he would take me to another chess club. The next weekend, I would travel to, to Toronto, to Ottawa, to other cities in Canada to play weekend tournaments. And I would need to do my homework during the week, but for a longer period of time. You have to make some sacrifices if you want to reach your, your goals. And there are, there are no secrets. How do you balance it? You uh, you sleep less and you work harder. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I can uh, imagine. Uh, um... Thank you for the raid, uh, Fiona. I'm doing an interview right now. So you guys uh, <laughs> tune in and uh, know how a Canadian kid uh, can uh, can make it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so for, for the young players that are watching, I, I know a lot of people here that are watching, hoping to become... Uh, GM or IM or FM, uh, hopefully at some day. Uh, what are the top three tips you can give to young players in chess when it comes to yeah. improving their game? I I think um, as, especially nowadays with with COVID, uh, I mean my tips are not even related to. 
to COVID necessarily, but with the boom online, I think my tips are really in line uh, with this. And I, I even took, took notes uh, uh, about this one. But, but basically, it's a combination of tips and mistakes that they have to, uh, to avoid. And I know that watching streams is not, uh, we're, we're not the best role models for this. But the first tip I would tell those people who are serious about chess would be to stop playing blitz and bullet. You have to, you have to pace yourself, play so, slower time control, and only those games, only those serious games will really make you improve. So that's the first tip slash mistake that I would, I would tell them to, to avoid, to avoid playing fast chess. I mean, it's, it's fun. <clears throat> I love bullet, I love blitz, but I'm an adult. I know that if I'm in tournament mode, I know that if I'm training for an IM norm tournament, I'm not going to play blitz and bullet until three in the morning. I know that I'm going to reach out to some friends, reach out to some training partners, try to get those rapid games in. And that would be the first tip. Um, the second tip following my first tip would be to not only play games, but actually analyze your games. You can either get a coach, you can either get friends, you're the same level, uh, analyze your games, go over your games and figure out what went wrong. Uh, you can play a million games and not analyze them and you're going to make the same mistakes over and over again. So I would say that analyzing your games, if you can afford having a coach, is one of the best things that, that can happen uh, for, for your, uh, for, to improve. And the last thing is while analyzing your games, I, I feel that nowadays I, I see some people working on chess. I see some kids working on chess. People rely a lot on the engines today. And the engine, I, I believe, is a great tool if used correctly. Unfortunately, I see so many people playing online and all they do is that they click on that game report and they go over all the blunders that the computers uh, identifies and they go oh right i shouldn't have played that move computer tell me what was the best move and they go over the critical moments of the game and after figuring out what they should have done they have the false sense that they actually improved and that they understood what happened when in fact they didn't understand nothing the computer just gave the best move without explaining anything so i think it is a great tool if used correctly you can use a computer to try to identify your mistakes, but you also have to sit down and figure out what went wrong and why. And a computer cannot explain this. So either do the work by yourself of, or have someone explain it to you. And I would, say that, um, I would say that too much computer, too much engine is not necessarily good for your chess. You really have to sit, sit, sit down with a, with a real chess board or you know, get some help. Get some help and really understand chess. Well, thank you. I think I think those are three wonderful tips. Uh, so, number one, um, avoid playing as uh, as many blades and bullet chess yes. as much as you can. Make sure you're getting some slow chess as well to improve. Uh, and number two, get a coach if you can afford it. Uh, a coach would do uh, would go a long way in helping you improve your chess. Uh, and then... uh, the second tip was actually analyze your games. If you can again, afford it, get a coach. Get so a coach, that's right. If you can afford it, get a coach. But analyzing your own games is really crucial. That's uh, right. That's right. Yes. That's so important. I, I totally agree. Analyzing your game, uh, so so important. So that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So tell us a little bit about the role. I believe you got a coach. Uh, I don't know how early you started using a coach, uh, but tell us tell us the role the coach played in improving your chess. I. I would say that uh, I would say that in my um, childhood, I had two main coaches. So I'm really sorry if I cannot name all of them, but I had two main coaches. And uh, uh, the first one was uh, Richard Berube. Uh, he's the uh, general director of the Quebec Chess Federation today. He's a FIDE master. Uh, mm. I had uh, Richard until uh, maybe I was 12 or 13. And then I went with uh, FIDE master Sylvain Barbeau. I don't know if you know him, but he used I don't to. Know uh, him. No, yeah, he, he used to be active. Bit, yeah. Now he's pretty much a retired player. But I had two, two coaches who really helped me uh, 
get to the level I'm at today. And then I, I would say that following the story I was telling about uh, when I stopped playing chess, um, other people helped me after this, after this period, after this long break. It was really, really random, but a very fortunate meeting that I made around 2014, 2013, 2014. I met Aman Hamilton, who was often coming to Montreal, winning all the open tournaments back then. <laughs> and I just got in touch with him. And uh, we started hanging out just as friends. And not too long after, everyone knows the rest of the story, but Eric Hansen, who is Aman's, pretty much Aman's best friend, okay. uh, moved to Montreal in 2015. And I reconnected. I, I connected with Aman and Eric and we became very good friends. They mm. started their, uh, their chess bra channel and uh, I started streaming uh, with them. And this is how I got back to playing chess because I was always coaching professionally. But when meeting Eric and Aman, I got to uh, sit in the streaming chair and start playing chess again. And they kind of gave me the passion to play again. And this is a story I've told many times on stream, but I'm still going to repeat for this interview. But yeah. uh, Chess Bros actually gave me my first chance uh, to make a comeback at chess after at least Wonderful. 10 years of not playing. They, uh, they basically uh, told me on stream that if they got enough uh, donations from their stream, would I be willing to make a comeback at chess? And I, <laughs> I didn't believe them back then. Back then, they were not... Uh, they were not as big as today. They just that's right, that's they right. just started their own channel, and I was like, "Sure, if you can afford a plane ticket, I'll go." And I, I kind of bluffed, you know. I I wasn't expecting to make a comeback, and I just said that because I I didn't believe they, they could do it. And it's only some weeks after that Eric told me, "Lafong, we raised the money. You are going to St. Louis," and <laughs> I barely know what the St. Louis Chess Club was, but obviously. We all know that it's one of the most prestigious chess club in the world, of if course, not the course. most prestigious one. And Eric, with his contact, uh, just put me in the I Am Norm tournament in St. Louis. Uh, so wow. I made a comeback in St. Louis uh, under the chess bras. And uh, to my biggest surprise, in my first tournament after not playing for 10 years, I still perform at my rating at 2300 FIDE. And I, I was competing with uh, young kids. Uh, Carissa Yip was 12 back then. Hans Niemann was 13. I, I was playing with, with those young guns. Hans is almost a GM today. And uh, just to hang in there with them was, uh, was an honor for me. And uh, it gave me confidence that uh, if I haven't played for 10 years and I'm still hanging in, hanging in with, with those people, maybe, maybe I should give it a, a shot. So... Uh, not even three months later, I went back to St. Louis, and this is where I had my first I Am Norm, and it was a total oh, wow. surprise too. Total surprise. Uh, I wasn't expecting to be even close to to make a norm, but making that norm kind of gave me also false confidence because uh, the thing is, I wouldn't say that I was um, the most hardworking player. I always counted on my natural talent to perform. And mm -hmm. I think it got me to FM level pretty easily. But I realized that at FM level, this is where if I stop, if I don't put any more effort, if I don't study chess for real, this is where I'm going to be stuck at. And I real, uh, realized it, unfortunately, a little too late. After my I am norm that I made in St. Louis, I played two more tournaments in St. Louis and those didn't go my way. And this is where I realized that I can't be teaching full time, not prepping for tournaments and going there. Uh, in my last tournament, this is probably the, the first time I'm sharing this uh, with you and with everyone from the stream. Mm -hmm. But in my last tournament, I was playing chess and my mind was not there. I knew I didn't prep and I... You know this feeling you have when you play chess and you want to do everything you can to win a game? This is yeah. an attitude that every champion has. And I always had this attitude my whole life. But in that last tournament in St. Louis, I didn't have it. I was offering draws. I was accepting draws. And people were very disappointed. I, uh, I came back to Montreal 
I remember uh, Grandmaster Robin Van Kempen made a comment that made me so sad. He said, Lofang, the way you played in St. Louis, I would rather lose all my games than make draws like this. And when he said that, I promised to myself that I would never play a tournament with that attitude or without preparing. And I haven't played a tournament since. That was my last tournament. And I promised myself that if I'm going to make a comeback at chess, I'm going to be very serious about it. And I'm going to, I'm going to study and I'm going to change my attitude and I'm going to get that title. And this is the attitude I need to have. And uh, I, I would say that uh, streaming, I just started my own stream a month ago, might be the final boost that I needed uh, to, to make that I am one day. Uh, the chess bros gave me a second boost. It wasn't enough. Uh, maybe I need to find the third boost uh, myself. And uh, this is pretty much where my story ends as of today. I'm in a situation where my dream is to make I am. I believe I have mm -hmm. the potential, uh, but am I willing to put the work? Uh, that's the that's the question. Yeah, I mean, we we'll believe we we'll believe you have the potential too. Uh, you are a talented player, and, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that you share that story so that is such a a good story is a good lesson for everyone here and and i'm glad i'm glad that you recognized you recognize that uh, and you know what it takes uh to to perform right so so i'm glad i'm glad you're sharing that story and uh, and so just to confirm uh i know you said it but let's just confirm you still have the dreams of hope of getting your remaining I am not. Is that, is that correct? Of course. But uh, <laughs> awesome. okay. That's ha good. having a dream and acting on it are two different things. We can all That's dream true. about That's stuff. True. But if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you don't push towards your dream, what is the point to have a dream? So it is a dream. I believe it could come true. And I just need to, uh, to push myself. Uh, I think right now it's COVID, so I have a very good excuse to to not do it. But when COVID ends, I'm going to have a very, very important decision to make. And this is why I'm forcing myself to, to tell the story on stream today, because now my story is public. I, I'm no longer hiding anything. I am exposing my, my truth and I'm, I'm counting on my chat to call me out when COVID is going to end. Uh, I'm, I'm counting on my chat to say, Lafong, remember that day, December 2nd? You had an interview, you said that you have a dream and are you going to go for it? Uh, I'm going to feel the pressure when, uh, when they're going to tell me this. That's right. And we're, and we're going to remind you too. <laughs> so we, we're all looking forward to your, to your second, second comeback, I think, if I put it that way. Yes. <laughs> second comeback to chess. Uh, awesome. And, and so I'm glad you connected, uh, connected with Eric and Amon. Uh, those are two. Our popular Canadian players. I've been in touch with them a couple of times, uh, and so that is that is awesome. Okay, uh, so final question. Uh, I know you are now broadcasting. Is there something else you want Canadian players to know about you that you want to share? Uh, if there are people here that want to get in touch with you, maybe for a chess lesson, maybe as a coach. Is that something you offer? What uh, what can you share? Yes, so so basically, um, I am now a part time teacher and a part time streamer. It is uh, weird to say this, but uh, yeah, uh, with with COVID, uh, a lot of uh, lessons in schools are, are canceled. So if you guys want lessons, now is the best time. <laughs> um, basically, uh, the, people can connect with me through my Twitch very easily here, uh, Lofonghua. And uh, through my Instagram, uh, at Lofonghua, those are the two best ways to, uh, to connect with me if people want lesson. Um, I'm going to say something. Um, it, is a, it is a project. Uh, I don't want to make it official yet, but uh, I am in the works of organizing a seminar slash workshop uh, with the stream over here. Uh, I, I don't want to reveal too much because... It will probably be a, a limited capacity kind of thing. So I don't want to make it official, but I'm in the works of organizing something for, for the stream, some, uh, some workshop during the weekend uh, co coming soon. So uh, stay tuned, guys. Okay. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. So you did mention that. Uh, so you teach part-time, you stream part-time. Is there something you do full-time? 
Uh, nope. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, so, I, so I, I, um, it's funny because I actually have a degree. I have a master's degree in computer science. Uh, but, uh, but chess has always been my passion. And I am so happy to be my own boss. I'm so happy to wake up in the morning and have no one to tell me what to do. And I'm so happy to be in full control of my schedule. And I'm a very ambitious person. And I think it only works if you're going to be ambitious. So I'm very happy uh, the way it is right now. And uh, sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. But uh, <laughs> I'm well, very I mean, cool. There's with nothing this. to be sorry about. So you're full time in chess. That's what it is. Yeah, uh, exactly. And it's good to know that. Um, okay. All right. So I know we're going to go. You're going to be sharing. You have a game prepared that you want to share with us now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just one question here in, in my chat that I see. Uh, so Joey is asking if you've ever played any other types of sports other than chess. Uh, do I play other type of sports? Yeah. Uh, I would say that tennis is my favorite sport by far, but uh, I am just a very casual player. Um, I enjoyed snowboarding as a kid. Uh, and if we can call chess a sport, I guess we have to call foosball a sport. So I'm actually a very decent foosball player. And um, I hate to brag, but I was a Canadian champion uh, in foosball in 2005. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> oh, so those awesome. are the sports I play. Oh, that is really awesome. That is really awesome. I think that is special. Um, okay. So why don't you go ahead and... I don't know if you have any questions from your live stream there that you want to answer. That's a very dangerous thing to say. Guys, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to open it for, um, uh, let's say, five to ten minutes max, and then I really have to get going with the game. Uh, is okay. this okay? Is this okay for you? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so chat, um, this is a very serious interview. We're trying to keep things serious today. Uh, any non-serious question will not, uh, will not be answered. Uh, so you guys can go ahead. I'm reading chat right now. <laughs> go, take a swing. Go ahead, and uh, we'll answer the most interesting ones. <laughs> Are you reading my chat right now, or, or not? Uh, yeah, I'm there right now. <laughs> I'm reading. I see a lot of people saying, "Oh, I have a question. I have a question." Okay. Uh, what part of your game do you need to study the most? I, I would say that opening is probably the, the one part I need to uh, do the most part, uh, work on. I'm a very predictable player. And uh, see, already I'm having a match against uh, FM Eugene Hua on Sunday. I'm very predictable. I'm going to have to do some work against Eugene. He's coming at yeah. me. He knows what I'm playing. So, uh, That's an interesting one, yeah. Yeah, so I, I have to do some work in the opening. What's your worst opening? <laughs> okay, they're clearly trolling. Um, it, it's a joke because I have a cat named Benoni and everyone thinks that Benoni is a bad opening. Okay, fine. I'm going to admit it. Benoni is not the best opening, but it's a cute opening and I love it. So that's my opening. Um, do you still have... Do you still have association with Chess Bra? Are you playing anything with them in the future? Um, I mean, I'm still friends with the Chess Bras. Uh, they moved to Calgary, so I'm not really streaming with them right now. But uh, hey, I'm a streamer. If they want to collab with me, send the, send the contract over. I'll, I'll be down. I'll be down. Uh, how do you get so good at bullets? Oh, th this would take six hours, guys. Th this is a separate <laughs> lesson and I might charge for it. But basically, um, anticipate pre-moves, uh, punish pre-moves, and uh, spam bishop h6 in the chat. This is how you get good at bullet. Uh, do you think you're more of a tactical or positional player? Uh, this is a very interesting question uh, because right. I have a feeling that I'm more tactical, but with white, I play a lot of positional openings. Uh, I think I had this discussion with Eric Hansen and he didn't give me a clear cut answer, but he, he told me that I'm not as tactical as I think. Maybe he just thinks I'm bad in both. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what kinds do you do for IM training? So I, I mostly played in those IM norm tournaments. So when you play in an IM norm tournament, you know in advance all your opponents. So basically, I would prepare against them, try to figure out what they will play, and uh, prepare a lot of openings for the IM norm tournament. Uh, my favorite opening? Uh, well, Benoni, Dragon, 4 pounds attack. This is easy. Um... 
Hi, LaFong. I know you've lived in Montreal for pretty much all your life. Is there a push to potentially relocating to another country, city, to aid your chess pursuit? That's a very good question, Leverage Chess. Um, listen, I... That, that, That 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 tears that that tears my heart to to say this, okay. Um, I am completely in love in Montreal. I I don't know about other people how they feel about their own city, but I I really deeply in love with Montreal. I will always love Montreal. If I have to relocate, I will. I will if I have to. Uh, but I just love Montreal so much. Well, Montreal is a lovely city. So yeah. I, I'm not against the idea, though. I'm not against the idea. If if uh, there is a good enough good enough reason for me to relocate, I would be willing to do it. Uh, I don't know if you know. Way. I am. I am uh, Thomas uh, Cannon. Cannon. Sorry. I am Thomas. Do you know him, the Canadian chess player? I am Thomas. Uh, Thomas he, he's Cernan. a GM. No, he's still an I am. Also, oh, sorry, 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 Thomas Kernan. Yeah, Thomas Cannon. Yes, that's yes. right. That's right. And he just moved. He just moved to Europe. Wow. Uh, but not for chess. I don't think it's for chess. Though. Okay. It's more for lifestyle. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not against the uh, the idea. Uh, okay. Someone is friends with Eugene. He's so chill. Yeah, Eugene is very chill. Uh, Mark, you can't find. Okay, some people trolling. Uh, what do you tell uh, low-level players when they are stuck in the 14-1500 range? Well, I, I think this goes for the questions I've been asked before. Uh, play slower time control, analyze your games, and don't use the engine too much. Uh, go to Toronto, okay. I love Montreal too. J'aime Montréal. Yeah. Are you saying you won't be wearing a Flames jersey anytime soon? No, no, no. Not wearing a Flames jersey. <laughs> but but I'm not too much into the Habs either. Since PK Subban have been traded, I, I kind of stopped watching the Habs. Um, but I'm a big, big, big World Cup fan. Like whenever there's a World Cup, I cheer for Brazil, and this is my my country. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, Edmonton. Okay, I think I think we're pretty much done. That's right. So we can go into the game now. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the bird opening? Uh, I will plead the fifth. Plead the fifth. Okay. So let's go to the game. Uh, you will stay here, right? While I analyze. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be here. Okay, uh, so you can let me go into this layout. Okay, so awesome people. And you can't share your screen, right? Because if you share your screen, that's gonna mess up. Right? Exactly, but okay. but they can watch the stream. Okay, yeah, we'll watch the stream. They can watch the stream. Okay, <clears throat> so guys, um, my favorite game of all time that I played would have to be. Uh, versus Alexander Mikhailovsky, uh, who is the older brother of uh, Viktor Mikhailovsky. Uh, Alexander Mikhailovsky is an international master, and it happened uh, at the Quebec Open the year I made FM. Unfortunately, I showed this game on the Chess Bra channel, and I also showed this game a million times on stream. So I decided to not go for that game because I have a feeling that people have seen it, and it's a Benoni. Uh, so I'm not going to show that game today. Uh, however, I decided to go for another game, which was played in 2016 in the tournament in St. Louis, in which I made my final I Am Norm. And um, it was a game I played against an international master from the US. His name is Michael Brooks, and I was playing with the black pieces. And I'm just trying to get, uh, to get my setup right. So I think you guys can see it, right? Because I'm not going to put the moves. Otherwise, it's kind of uh, boring when I'm going to try to make you guess the moves. So can everyone see the names properly, uh, the board properly? Just l let me know if everything is good. Okay, I think it's good. So this game was played uh, in 2016 in St. Louis. Uh, it was during the I Am Norm tournament, and it was round five. I was sitting with a score of two and a half out of four, which is pretty good. And I was playing the number one seed of the tournament. Michael Brooks was uh, rated maybe 24, 24-10, 24-something. Uh, you can't see the names. Uh, it's in the bottom. It's on the bottom of the black pieces. Guys, it's not time. It's not a good time to troll. Come on, guys. We are live with EMC, and you guys are doing this to me. Okay, layout is looking good, and so are you. Okay, that's good. That's good. Finally, someone not trolling. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start the game, guys. Um, so, Ken, if you have any questions from your, your chat, just uh, relay the questions to me. 
Uh, says your name, no score on screen. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to show the score. I'm, I'm not going to show the moves because if I do show the moves, you guys are going to know what happens, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm not... Okay. So I'm going to be reading chat, guys, uh, much more than during my interview. And uh, the way to do this is really to interact with me. So let's make it fun, guys. Ask a lot of questions and uh, just uh, just be serious about it. All right. Um, so the backstory to, uh, to that game is that uh, I actually played this a million times uh, over the board against my good friend Eric Hansen. Okay, and when I say I played this a million times over the board, I mean I lost a million times over the board against Eric Hansen in this variation. Eric likes to play anti Sicilians and Blitz uh, because he uh, doesn't have to know much theory and can just beat me, you know, using his skills. So when we prepared for Michael Brooks, uh, we knew he would play something like, like this. So I was uh, pretty familiar with this system. So he plays c3 here, I go knight f6. And uh, one of the main moves over here is actually a bishop e2 or bishop d3. But just, just for fun, I'm going to show bishop e2. Uh, very, very, very common trap. If I take this pawn, well, I can already resign here and I lose, uh, lose a knight. I think knight c6 is not the most precise move here uh, because they can still go d4. And let's say I take, take and go here. Uh, he can still go d5. And if I move my knight, I lose my knight on e4. Um, so against bishop e2, the most precise move would just be play uh, g6. And I'm not gonna, not gonna show too much theory, but basically until I castle, I cannot take e4. So after castling, he goes bishop f1. And now white is really trying to get control of the center. So I need to put, uh, put some pressure here. Um, if he goes for the center anyways, a move like this, I think here it is too premature. I take and I go knight c6. And this is uh, kind of annoying for, uh, for white because I'm threatening to take here. And he cannot take with the queen because the pawn is hanging. So he would, he would have to take with the pawn. And if he has to come back with bishop e2, uh, this is hanging. So white is pretty much forced to do something like this. But now, as we all know, two pawns in the center. If you can force one to push and block the other one, then you have a lot of counterplay. Queen a5 come in, rook c8, knight c4. And this is pretty much a good game for black. Um, but he didn't play that. Uh, so I'm going to have to analyze uh, and finish in time. So I'm going to do my best over here, guys. He played d3, which is a very conservative way uh, of playing. So after d3, I go g6 and uh, knight bd2. <laughs> as we all know. Yeah, exactly. As you all know, because I respect you, chat. Bishop g7, g3. Castles, bishop g2, knight c6. This is, a, this is an opening that you see a lot of players play in blitz and bullet because it is so simple to play. It is just a very, very simple for, uh, setup for white. And I would say that I played this many, many times for those who, uh, who see me stream. So knight c6 was played, he goes castle. And in this structure, well, black has a very simple plan. For, so for, for beginners, for people who don't know who, where to attack, basically you look at your pawn structure, you look at where you uh, have more space and you try to expand on that side. So when you see the pawn structure pointing towards this way, I, as black, try to push my pawns like this and expand on the queen side. Um, so I played rook b8, a very natural move. Rook e1, b5, a3, uh, obviously to, uh, to prevent b4, a5, d4. And here I have a lot of choices, uh, but I decided to go knight d7 which is a very flexible move. I am putting pressure on the pawn over here. Um, if he takes the pawn, I'm planning to take back with the knight, which creates a lot of weaknesses on the light squares. And if he goes for d5, I always have the option to play knight ce5. I don't see anyone typing in the chat. Are you all completely bored by what I'm saying? Or you don't understand what I'm saying? Or you're enjoying it so much that you are speechless? Which one of the three options, guys? <laughs> this is great. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. You should do this more. Well, uh, I should do this more. Well, elevate my chest. Just, uh, just contact me. All right. So knight d7 was played. Uh, so he went knight, knight f1, very flexible move, just uh, guarding the pawn with uh, his three pieces over here. And uh, after, after knight f1, this is where, this is where 
my games against Eric Hansen really paid off. Uh, because I remember with Eric, um, I would do a lot of those. I would do a lot of, uh, of taking here and push B4. And somehow he would always play something like this and later on push A4, B3. And somehow my knight doesn't have any squares and it's kind of annoying to play against this. So when I was preparing for Michael Brooks, I was uh, having Eric's voice in my head. And for those of you who know uh, Eric Hansen, um, if you guys ever take lesson from him or if you get any advice from him, Eric is, let's say, the opposite of Aman. Aman is this really nice guy who's going to tell you nice things about the way you play, give you support, encourage you, say, don't play this, this is better, I like it when you do this, you know, positive reinforcement. But Eric Hansen is the opposite. If you play a bad move, he's going to give it to you. Why did you play this? What's the point? This is so bad. So a lot of, uh, a lot of negative reinforcement, which to some extent works with me. And I was having this uh, Eric voice in my head of like, why do you play this? Why do you play before? This is so bad for your knight. So he actually told me what is the great idea over here. And it is A4, which is a much better idea than before because it prevents A4, first of all. And second of all, it creates a lot of outposts for the knight here on C4 and on B3. So A4 is a great move and I really liked it here. Uh, so I played A4. He went Bishop E3. I finally took. And uh, okay, he could take with a C pawn, but I think I just go knight a5, rook c1, knight b6, and I really punish him here on the, on the light squares. So he decided to go knight d4 instead, and uh, I played knight a5, very natural move, and then knight d2, knight c5. And here it is really a battle of the squares here. So his knight is preventing my knights from coming to hunt him, take some space on b3 and on c4. Uh, while my knight are trying to uh, to get in. So queen e2 was played, queen b6. And now my opponent did something very, very, very interesting. He went knight c2. And honestly, my first thought over here was, what is he doing? Okay, he's pinning my knight. He's never threatening to play b4. This doesn't look like a move that's very offensive. But looking back... I realized what he wanted to do. He wanted to reroute the knight to, to d5, which is a very strong square for uh, for white. So in this game, it is actually a very positional game. Uh, it, it might not have all the fireworks you would expect from the best game I've ever played, but uh, it's, a, it's a good mix of positional chess and tactics. So knight c2 was played. So I played bishop e6, knight b4, and in those pawn structures, something that you guys have to realize is that there are a lot of good squares for knights. So bishops are less valuable. If he moves, if he plays knight d5, I'm not really concerned about trading my bishop versus a knight. His pawn would get here, and then I would be getting all the light squares. My type of structure with white, yes, I've played this against Game Over Bro many times. And uh, Maroon, this is actually a very high quality game. So I'm very proud to show this game, actually. Uh, exactly. B4 doesn't work because of en passant. So uh, knight b4 was played. Uh, sorry, knight b4, bishop e6. Now it is black's turn. I play knight c4. And I mean, he has a lot of choices here. He, he could take, uh, which is the most natural move. But he played another move that really surprised me. Uh, when is it okay to push uh, to put your bishop in front of your pawn? Just when it won't block the other bishop? Um, it's okay to put the bishop in front of the pawn when you have no intention of pushing this pawn. If the bishop covering your pawn prevents your pawn from pushing, or if your bishop in front of your pawn is potentially exposed to some pawn pushes, this is bad. But in this case, I have no intention to push this pawn uh, because of the bishop over here. Uh, so... Yes, bishop e6 is a very normal thing here. Um, okay, so knight f1 was played. And I was kind of surprised by this move because my first reflex is, why is he giving me his bishop versus a knight? But when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, aha, he wants to get, you know, a power play here on d5. He wants two knights. He wants to end up with a knight on d5. 
So another fund is actually very interesting move. So I was patient over here. I decided to just go rook f e8. He went rook a d1. And now I had a brilliant idea after rook a d1. I took, but I made sure to exchange one of the two knights with my knight. Or at least I tried. I played knight a6 over here. So once I get rid of those two pieces, I'm making sure that he will never end up with a knight on d5. So that's the reason why I played knight a6 here. So he went here. I take. He took back. And then I went here with the idea to drive the knight away with potentially knight c7 next move. Uh, then... He surprised me again. Uh, don't forget, guys. He is the international master. He is 2400. And I'm just a feeding master. So although the position is equal, he's the one who has to push for a win here. Uh, so he took some risks and decides to play h4. Which is very interesting. When you think about it, uh, if this knight was on f6, maybe h4 and h5 would not be as strong. But in this position, uh, given that I lost my bishop here, Given that I only have one piece to defend my king side, it's actually a very interesting idea to come uh, and attack my, my king side over here. So h4 was played. And given that he doesn't have a lot of pieces left, a lot of minor pieces left, given that he doesn't have a bishop to pressure the pawn, given that he doesn't have a second knight to pressure the pawn, given that he only has this rook over here, I figured it is a very good moment to, you know, kick the knight away with e6. Yeah, this is exactly what I played. Congratulations, chat e6 was played here. So after e6, uh, he doesn't want to trade knights. So uh, he decided to go knight f4. And I mean, now the knight has done his job. I need to kind of reroute it. And I try to find the best squares for the knight, which are pretty much those three squares over here. So knight c7 doesn't really accomplish anything. So I decide to move my queen away and try to reroute the knight to some better squares over here. Knight d3 was played. Rook a d8, just covering the d6 pawn. h5, knight c5. Don't forget, guys, he's the, he's the IM. He needs to play for a win. If he wants to make a draw, he can just take here. So no pressure on my side. He goes knight b4. I go queen b6, potentially with the idea of exchanging nine knights. And now he goes for the kill. He goes queen g4. So seeing this, I'm a little worried. I don't like the fact that, you know, he's bringing his pieces to the king's side. So I'm trying to go here. Yeah, f4 exposes the king a lot, guys. I have my queen on b6. I don't think it's such a such a great idea. So uh, over here. Oh, thank you so much. We have 100 viewers. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate that Am I, when I'm doing educational content, people are tuning in. And uh, I can uh, I can show some great content other than by uh, lofonging people. So it's really great to see. Um, so I go knight d7 over here, which is a very natural move. I'm trying to reroute my knight to uh, e5 which will offer good protection around the king. He takes, I take. Uh, oh, thanks for the sub, the bird himself. I really appreciate it. So h takes, rook e2, knight e5, queen h4. So his queen is really well placed over here. Rook bc8, knight c2, knight c4, knight d4. All right. This, I would say, is the most important moment of the game. So after knight, knight c4, he plays knight d4, and basically he is defending his pawn, and he has a very simple plan to come and try to mate me. Although I'm probably surviving with king f8, and as you guys may know, with a bishop and a king over here, without the dark square bishop, white can't do anything about it, but it is an unpleasant pressure. So first question for you guys, chat, EMC, Twitch, whoever is watching, how would you approach this position as black and what would you play? But guys, I don't want any single moves. So if you're gonna if you're gonna say knight takes b2, I want you to back it up with variations. Okay? I don't want you to say knight b2 and we will see. This is not how we play chess, guys. This is a classical game. You're playing Michael Brooks, International Master 2410. You're not gonna win by just playing knight b2 and with your intuition. Okay, I see some uh, I see some knight b2 and rook c3. That's to be calculated. Uh, I see some rook c5, rook h5. Interesting. Uh, I might have some g4, bishop f3 against uh, against rook c5. Uh, what if white had pushed? Yeah, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. 
Ken, I don't know if you're muted, but if your chat has uh, anything to say here, it is a great moment to ask them, what would Black play in this position? Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm checking the chats. Mm -hmm. So see, so if you're on this Zoom call, uh, what is the best position, what's the best move for Black? Black, right? Yeah, but also best. the idea, not just, and the, know, I, that's right. Best moves. The idea based on the position. Yeah, because you, you can suggest moves, but you really have to, uh, you know, because a move like knight takes, rook takes, rook takes, let's say. I mean, I got rook takes over here. This might be hanging. You have to be very careful about this. So this is a most important moment of the game and I don't mind taking some extra minutes to let the chat discuss because after this moment, the game goes into a certain direction. Yeah, exactly. For those of you on the Zoom, if you want to speak, just let me know. I can unmute you. 95 is interesting. I mean, it's certainly a good move, but guys, my knight just went from e5 to c4, right? So I could play back here, but playing on Lee Chess. Uh, I'm playing on Lee Chess right now, guys. Knight a3 is pretty much the same as knight b2. I don't think you get enough comp, guys. I don't think you get enough comp. Anyone wants to speak on your side, uh, Ken? Well, let me check. Well, I see people putting stuff in the Zoom. So they're looking at Bishop D4 to take on D4 and to play E5. Take on D4 and play E5. And what if I go back with the Rook? So let's say, sorry. I don't know if they can hear me, but is there an idea behind taking the knight? Knight b2 or knight e3 doesn't seem to work. Hello, GSS4. We're looking to uh, we're looking for the best move for uh, for black here. And honestly, uh, before I give the answer, one of the hardest thing that uh, you guys can uh, can do. Sometimes you have some blind spots. Sometimes your brain is programmed to not even look at a move because you have been taught that that move is bad. You can look at sacrifice like 92, 93, this is no problem. But some moves that look bad, you'll discard right away. You don't even look at them. Your brain discards them for you. It doesn't even reach candidate moves. F6 is the move. <laughs> I was going to roast someone, but... Uh, it's uh, somehow a serious stream today, so I will refrain from, uh, from roasting that person. Um, before, before a b4, queen takes d4. I think sacking the queen here is not in the spirit of the position. Rook c5, yeah, rook c5, g4. Rook c5, g4. Listen. Only one person in the chat got the right answer, and I didn't read it out loud, of course. And uh, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that that person found it uh, because he is not only a VIP, he also has a founder's badge. I went to his wedding recently, you know, that kind of guy is cool and finds the answer. But other than that, very disappointing chat, very disappointing. <laughs> So someone from your side uh, can uh, had the right answer, but not the right explanation. But 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 someone someone um, in my chat found the answer, and I'm gonna give it. So the right answer, guys, it is Bishop takes d4, um, and the reason why no one played this because you don't give a bishop against the knight, you just don't. But look at the genius idea over here. So first of all, um, okay, if cd, it is pretty much the same. Uh, but it would have been better than the game, okay? But I'm going to go with the game. So rook d4 has been played, and the idea is to go king g7. And it is funny how white spent so much time 
pushing this pawn on h4, on h5, open up the king's side, all this to have an attack, and then black is the one who's going to end up attacking on the king's side. So I thought bishop d4 was a beautiful move. And a reason why, one of the reasons why it works positionally or even tactically is that white got rid of their dark square bishop. If this bishop was still here, no way in the world that you could be getting away with this. But uh, that was a brilliant move. Bishop d4 and king g7, and I didn't find it right away. In this position, I spent at least 15 to 20 minutes trying to look for a move. And at some point, my brain, I, I, I had this candidate move and my brain said, nah. But then I said, wait a sec, brain, wait a sec, wait a sec. What about takes and king g7? And I fought the instinct of discarding the move and it paid off. So takes, takes would have been better, by the way, because I don't get rook c5. It's still a very pleasant position for, uh, for, for black. For an example, king g7, this is my analysis, but basically rook c2, e5, just take control of the dark squares. And this is a very, very pleasant position. The, bad, the bishop is really bad over here and I have some good pressure. I control two files. This is great. Uh, but un unfortunately for him, he played rook d4. And then king g7 was played, rook d1, he's going back, rook h8, queen f4, queen c5. And already, I'm basically threatening to, you know, to get in. So he has to do something about it. So bishop f3 was played, and now very easy, double the rooks, rook h6, rook c2, rook h8. And now queen c1 was played, and... Next question, how do you keep going here with black? How do you keep going with black? So you are completely in control, guys. You're completely in control, but this is not enough to mate. This is not enough to mate. How do you continue here? Uh, get that light square bishop out of here. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Well, I guess you have to get your knight into the game. Into knight the into the side. game. But but the knight the knight blocks the queen though. So if I play a move like knight uh, e5, it's not that obvious. I, I'm gonna give you one move. Okay, I'm gonna give you one move. I think. Uh, let's go here. Rook h2 is. I think it's very obvious. Like just put the rook here. If he plays bishop g2, then I go queen h5. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys this move. Uh, he went rook d4. And here, black to play. I was very proud to find this move over here. I was very happy about this move over here. So I think if I go knight e5, it's okay. But the knight is kind of blocking the queen. Maybe he can just go bishop uh, or queen d1 maybe. Queen d1 should be fine. I have, a, I have a good sequence of move here. A good sequence of move, guys. Don't worry, Ken. We are, uh, we are doing good in terms of timing. We're doing great. Yeah, that's true. That's yes. true. Sacrificing a rook on f2. Guys, guys, guys. If you're going to sack some pieces, you have to be able to back it up. I want to see some variations. Be a man and sack your queen. That's not being a man. That's being suicidal. <laughs> queen h5. Whoa, game over, bro, with some creative stuff. Queen h5. Can I just take and go queen f1? King f1? Yeah, you're not even mating, right? Like, like, like if I take, take, you're not even threatening mate. Like, if I check, I go here and here. Knight a5 and knight b3. Buddy, we're not playing positional chess over here. I'm just going to remove my queen and my rook. No, no, no. We're trying to mate. We're trying to mate. We are trying to mate. Burns a lot. What's up? Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. What is the winning sequence for black here? I think it's really beautiful. So, it all lies into how do you get your queen here, right? Like, like, like this is what I was trying to figure out in the game. Either attack the bishop and get the queen to h5 or get the queen on the h file. And I couldn't work it out until I found the winning sequence. Ah, oh, someone found it. Someone found it. It is Tony. 
Tony L103. Beautiful. E5. And this is a geometry that's hard to find. E5 with here and here. That's the winning sequence. Exactly. So when you cannot go to H5, find another square. And it's so hard to see this move because this is a pawn push. Your brain is programmed to think that it creates a backward pawn. So you don't want to make that move. It also blocks the queen. But once you move it, you realize how strong it is. So E5 with queen C8. There you go. That was played. So rook D5, queen C8. And now I'm basically threatening to go here and mate. So he has to do something about it. Okay. And uh, he went here. I went queen g4. And then it's really, really tough for him because I'm basically uh, trying to go here and to mate him. And now I'm going to ask you guys to spot a tactic. Queen d1 has not been played in the game, but what happens? Oh, uh, sorry, before I continue, uh, you guys are right. This would have won instantly if I have found f5, which I didn't find in the game. But f5 is really strong. I'm basically trying to play check, check, and take. And if he takes, I check, and I play check, and I take. So you guys are right. This wins. But my move wins as well. Uh, so I'm going to go back to this position. Uh, black to play and win. It's a really nice tactic. Rook g2, king g2, queen h3, king f3, f5 might win, but there's something really, really nice. There, there's something even nicer. Uh, so, so Lafon, before you go back, so before bishop to g2, uh, what about queen to f1? Queen f1 over here? Uh, I think rook e3 at the very least. Uh, sorry, 93 at the very least. I think. On the top of my head, it looks strong. Oh, okay. Because I'm still controlling the, the second rank, right? Like That's right. Yeah, so I think I had this move. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back here. That was a question from the chat, right? No, no, that was just a question I asked. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So what is the move here? Rook h1, did you guys calculate? Bishop takes, stop stacking pieces. <laughs> Rook h6. We're in this position, guys. What is the best move? Rook g2, king g2. Okay, Rook g2, king g2, queen h3, king f3, f5 might work. But there's a really nice move. Like I play it and it's re you resign immediately. Ah, some people found it. Yeah, knight e3. How beautiful is this move, guys? So the idea is that if he takes my queen, I mate. But if he takes, I just take. And he cannot avoid mate. This is just beautiful. So if he goes here, I go check, takes, takes, here, check, here, check, here, and mate. And I saw it. But unfortunately, he didn't play this. But I was I was crossing my fingers. I was praying that he would play this because 93 is so I'm gonna say it's so sexy. Like 93, if I if I had played this against an international master like this, like it would have been so nice. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't play that. Uh, he played queen e1. So I just went uh, queen h5, and this is where he he resigned because I'm I'm basically trying to mate, and uh, if he plays here, I just go check takes takes here check. King d1 forced. If king f1, I mate. Uh, he went king d1. And I could take the rook, but it is uh, even sweeter to play rook h1, forcing him to take. And then I take the queen and I take the rook. And this is how I won. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought it was a beautiful game because it was a mix of uh, strategy, tactic, story with Eric Henson helping me. And... Uh, that gave me a boost because I, I was at plus two, so three and a half out of five. This is how we count, guys. Uh, in, a, in a norm tournament, if you have to score plus four or plus five, it means the number of wins compared to, to losses. So I was on plus two at three and a half out of five. And uh, I eventually normed with six and a half out of nine. Oh, my mom says excellent analysis. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. 
LeFong flexing on us with his nasty games. Hey, EMC asked me to analyze one of my best games. They didn't say one of my worst games. You know, <laughs> I have some pressure. If you guys want to see my best games, I'm not going to show you something average, you know? Well, Alice, wonderful. That was, that was a great life. game. Great game. Thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. Uh, I think there are a few questions here on yeah. our chat. Uh, let me see, but these are, I don't think these are related to the games. It's okay. Uh, someone is asking here, so do you have a favorite Grandmaster? Um, so, so in terms of uh, studying chess and have an idol and have someone who plays so good in classical chess, I don't have an idol. Like I, I didn't grow up like thinking, oh, this guy is the best and stuff. Um, I can appreciate a lot of uh, different players. Uh, but I have to say that, uh, in the online world, the blitz, the bullet, like Nakamura is my God. Like he's my idol. Oh. Like, uh, Naka is really the, the goat. Oh, well, wonderful. Yes. So he must be really good. Uh, one last question here. Uh, someone is asking, what is your best, what is the best variation in the Sicilian defense? Oh, the dragon for sure. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get a lot of heat for that. Uh, no, no, it's a joke. Like the dragon is, uh, almost, uh, almost refuted. Um, but I like it. Uh, but hey, uh, I, I like things in life that are not necessarily the popular choice. Uh, you're asking me my favorite uh, Sicilian. The best, objectively, the best Sicilian would have to be Nydorf, I think. I think Nydorf is really solid. MVL plays it religiously and uh, it's not been refuted yet. So I would say Nydorf. I have no choice. Okay. All right. Awesome. So I think those are all the questions I have here. All right. Uh, so if there are no more questions on your end, then maybe we can wrap it up. On my end, uh, I mean, <laughs> okay, I'm going to give them, f uh, can I give them five minutes for questions? Yeah, before? five minutes is good. Okay. Guys, uh, do you have any questions on the game? If you don't have any questions on the game, I'm going to go on full screen. Uh, okay, probably that we can go on full screen. I don't think uh, they have anything else to say about the game. Have you ever touched a piece you didn't want to move, but then you had to move it because you touched it? Actually, yes. Actually, I have a very funny story. I, I actually, I think I was so young. I touched a piece. I was going to lose a piece and I begged my opponent to give me a chance, but he never did. And thank God he, he didn't. Uh, so I just lost the game and I learned from this and I never touched a piece again without having 100% uh, intention of moving it. <laughs> so yes, it happened as a kid. Uh, what was that opening? It was a close Sicilian, like an anti-Sicilian. Uh, no, I don't have three IM norms because if I had three IM norms, I would be uh, traveling everywhere. Even there's co even uh, even if uh, there's COVID, I would be traveling everywhere to try to gain that FIDE rating and get the uh, IM title. No, I only have one norm. Only have one norm. Thank you, Burrito. I appreciate the compliment. Uh, okay, anything else? Anything else, guys? Thank you, Alice. I really appreciate it. Were you world champion? No, only number five. Number five, under 10 years old in Germany. Uh, and I did meet Karpov. Uh, I did meet Karpov in that championship. I'm an uh, inside joke with my chat from yesterday's stream. Wonderful. Uh, guys, relevant question, please. Uh, Ken's time is very valuable. You guys have uh, two more minutes, says a dictator. Uh, no, I didn't grow up in Germany. <laughs> Divina, stop. Uh, what is the highest rated person that you've never, ever played? Uh, in the OTB or any kind of chess? Uh, because I've played Fabi a lot. I played Fabiano a lot over the board, like like uh, just in parties because he came to Montreal. Uh, my thoughts on Cole, London, and Torre. Wait, are you trying to put me to sleep? Next question, please. Uh, <laughs> nothing else. Okay, I think I burned my chat with that one. And okay. I think we can wrap it up. All soon. right, wonderful. Okay, so thank you, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. It was it my was pleasure. Really insightful. It was great to get to know you. Uh, you learn a little bit about your journey in chess, yes. um, and get to see you uh, show us this wonderful game uh, that you analyzed. Uh, good lessons for everyone watching today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much.